So yeah, my name is Nick Padulvic and I'm from the Australian National University where I'm doing my PhD in science communication and more specifically in climate change communication. And part of what I focus on is looking at how we're framing climate change communication in Australia and uh, something that I'll chat obviously more about in the next slides. But um, so I wanted to just give a little bit of a, a, an overview today of sort of what framing is um, and explain some of the some of the different kinds of climate change frames that are out there and how we go about communication. So, here we go. So, I can't really give a full history of science communication literature because it sort of goes back a little bit and don't have all that much time. But I'm just going to say very briefly that when it comes to communicating climate change and a lot of other complex socio-political scientific issues the facts generally don't give us enough in terms of meaningful engagement, in terms of good communication. Generally, for some people, they work well. For some people that are quite engaged, facts can be really useful. But when it comes to engaging wider publics and, and uh, more people on these kinds of issues, what can happen is that if you go into communicating or engaging with somebody with a bunch of facts, you can get them offside pretty quickly. And so something that the literature base is starting to recognise is that we need to really understand people's values and their beliefs and their attitudes when it comes to doing communication and good engagement on climate change. Because those sorts of values and worldviews are the frameworks that we use to understand the world and to understand problems. And so when we're trying to engage people, that's really something important to, to be able to recognize and to be able to work in to that communication. And so that's where framing comes in. So framing can be a way to align your messages or communication better with uh, particular people value sets or world views. And so framing itself is, is seen as a sort of way to enhance not just communication, but to open up meaningful dialogue and to make something a bit more meaningful for somebody else. So that's sort of our progression through time that science communication is sort of now understanding the importance of engagement as opposed to just translating facts like it used to be. This is just a little picture that I created for my uh, PhD proposal seminar. And it's just a visual representation using literal frames, although the frames that I'm talking about are more, um, you know, embedded within communication. But what I'm showing here is how you can take a certain part of a bigger issue and focus on just a few aspects of that, make them more salient, and then you can create a frame or create a meaning for that issue. So this is showing in the top left, uh, a public health frame. In the middle, uh, we've got a economic opportunity frame for climate change, and then a distance versus uh, local impacts on the right. So three different ways to frame this bigger issue. And that's sort of where this idea of framing comes in. So it, it's about emphasizing certain aspects of an issue over others in order to create that tailored understanding. So that can be um, um, specifically in, in communication. So determining what frame you want to talk about climate change in, but it can also be in just the conversations that you're having and the way that you're, that you're shaping the meaning of this issue. I just preempted my next point. So shaping the meaning of an issue, aligning your messages with people's values and beliefs. So what it allows you to do from a communications point of view, uh, to be able to tailor messages and make them more salient. But again, I'm wanting to try and make a case to balancing that out with not just communicating, but also engaging. So slightly different, but as a way to open up that productive conversation. And there's the final point as well. So that's a little bit on framing, a little bit on uh, what framing is um, and what we sort of think about in terms of science communication now. So I suppose what's important to see now is what frames sort of exist. There are a bunch of different frames, different climate change frames that are out there. So a study that, that I recently uh, did with my supervisor, which is currently under review, we looked at what climate change frames were existing out in the literature base. So what frames do we have evidence for? So from an from a effective communication point of view, how should we be talking about climate change? What frames engage people and what frames disengage people? We found that looking through a bunch of different literature that three predominant frames came out and that is that climate change is typically framed as you know, a scientific issue or an economic issue or one with environmental impacts. 
And they're the three common frames that you've probably come across yourself. So scientific, mainly being because it's a scientific issue at its core. Uh, economic, because it's response from governments, from policy and balancing the economy. That's a, that's a typical frame. And then the final one, uh, the environmental impacts, which we saw over summer. We saw um, very specific environmental impacts of climate change. So they're three fairly salient frames. But uh, something that we also found in this study is that there are lots of other frames as well, that there are not just these, these three climate change frames, that there are alternative frames. Before I show you those, I just want to say that the understanding that we take from how we frame climate change sort of comes from three main fields, from media studies, from psychology and social science. So the big question of how do we frame climate change to more effectively create communication is being worked on in a few different fields at the same time. And so we have quite a rich understanding from different areas, but as I'll sort of show you later, it, it doesn't always stack up in, in the way that you would expect. But back to the frames, this is a study from Bolson and Shapiro in environmental communication. And what they set out to do was to find what frames are being used by the US news media. And so they looked at a bunch of different articles uh, in US news and they did a bit of a, an analysis to understand what frames were coming out. And so you can see on the left column, that is the frame that they found in the news media article. In the middle is a bit of a definition of that frame. And on the right is an example of that used in communication. So the top three are our usual suspects that I, that I mentioned in the previous slide, scientific, economic, and environmental. But if you look below that, there are starting to be more alternative frames for climate change, like morality, disaster, political conflict, national security, and public health. Public health is one that's been coming, becoming uh, a bit more salient recently because of our bushfires and all the smoke. And it's someone, it's one that you've, you might have known about before or seen a bit more of recently. And so those alternative frames they found are starting to become more prominent as well in news media. This is something that we also found in the study that, that, that I did, which is currently under review, um, which we also found that these alternative frames are starting to be studied a little bit more. So we're starting to go beyond those three typical ways we talk about climate change to try to find better ways potentially to engage people. And so more research is happening in regards to these frames. So I chatted about then what frames exist, what framing is, but now I wanna show you a little bit about what kind of effect it can have, like why we care about it at all. Um, and so this is a, a figure from a study from Myers uh, et al in climatic change. And what they did was they wanted to understand what kind of frame for climate change elicited more hopeful emotions. And so they took um, a passage of text about climate change and they framed it as a national security issue. They took that same passage and framed it as an environmental issue and then the same one framed it as a health issue. They then gave those three framed messages, one to three different groups. And what they did was measure how many sentences made the respondent or the reader feel hopeful. And so the result was that they wanted to understand whether one particular frame resulted in more hopeful emotions. And I know Rod was talking about hope before. So this is something that is being thought about. And uh, you can see, so there's going to be a little bit of explanation of this graph, but just we'll just go step by step. So if we just look at the alarmed category on the left, um, we can see that each column represents a different frame. And each frame has a value, meaning that for a national security frame, people were responding more hopefully than the typical environment frame. But if we go right down to the other end of that spectrum, down to the dismissive end, you can see that the public health frame elicited more hopeful emotions than the national security frame. So that's showing that there is a framing effect across frames. But something else that, that you're seeing here is you're seeing these six categories at the bottom, alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. You may have come across this, but if you haven't, this is from a study back in 2008 or 2009, which took a nationally representative survey of people and broke them up based on their climate change attitudes and beliefs and sorted them into categories. And so people in the United States tend to go into one of these six categories. And there's also an Australian version of this. This was called the six Americas. There's an Australian version called the five Australias. And uh, it's a bit of a, um, a way to segment audiences 
And that's really important in science communication because we need to know who we're talking to. And this gives us a bit of insight into how to do that. I'm happy to answer questions on that later, but we'll move on just for now. This, oops, this next one is from uh, Bernard McGrath in uh, Nature Climate Change. And this is sort of the other, the other side of framing. So I just showed you some evidence um, showing the effect of that framing can have, that it, certain frames can be more effective than others. But there's also a bit of mixed evidence. So there's also some people who have done research to try and understand whether uh, framing climate change actually has any kind of effect and they have found no results. So this one is a bit of a mix. If you look at the policy support column on the left, what they're doing is using three different frames, economic co-benefits, good society and health benefits, and then they're measuring responses on the left. So they're trying to measure climate skepticism, trying to measure climate awareness. And if we take the second row, for example, you can see that the health benefits frame results, so they're measuring, um, does not believe in anthropogenic climate change. So the health benefits frame resulted in less belief, whereas the good society resulted in more. So that's an example of a potential framing effect. But if you look all the way down the column, you can see some frames are not distinguishable from others. So what I'm trying to highlight here with this, with this figure is that when we're using framing or trying to understand the, the, the power of climate change framing, it's not a simple picture. And it's not something that we can just do an experiment, find, find out something cool and then say, okay, here's a solution. It's a dynamic landscape. So frames in, in, in a sense, um, are sometimes the result of the particular time that we're in. So right now you could imagine a public health frame being fairly prominent because of all of the, the bushfires that we've just been through and the smoke, but in other times you might expect it not to be. So it's a quite a complicated picture, but it's an interesting picture. So just to, just to wrap up a little bit, uh, I just wanna say a couple of things from the more research side of what we need to do uh, through what I've read and through what I've tried to understand so far. So I've given you a case for, for using framing uh, in, in communication and engagement, but what we need to do specifically now with framing is, is better understand it within specific groups in, in different publics. So I use this word publics with an S because in science communication, they've traditionally used this word general public and general public doesn't really have a lot of meaning. It doesn't tell us a lot about who we're communicating or engaging with. So it's important to understand who we're talking with and so then we can better understand what kind of frames become resonant for them because we're not just trying to change someone's mind. I think that's a bit of a misconception with framing that we're not just trying to use a message to somehow turn a mental gear in your brain, change your mind and get you to do something. With framing, we're trying to more productively engage people with an issue. And that's something I'll tell you about on the next slide. We also want to explore, uh, so the, the role of framing beyond that just message tailoring, which is part of it. Uh, but like I said, engagement is also a big part of that. And we also need to study more in underrepresented countries. So in the study that I did with my supervisors, we found that most of our understanding of how to frame climate change comes from the United States and the United Kingdom. It probably comes as no surprise. So what we need to be able to do is recognize that that is an, an important part of the picture. But we also need to step beyond that and try and understand, compare across countries or go to more underrepresented countries so that we don't come out with a skewed and biased understanding. So as I mentioned with engagement, this is just something I wanna leave you with at the end, which is from McLaughlin et al. And this is from uh, a really great organization in the UK called Climate Outreach. And they do really good climate engagement stuff, research and also write a bunch of reports and do a lot of really good stuff. Uh, and what they did in their most recent report is you can see this figure is saying, why engage on climate change? And I just want to draw your attention to the second one, which says focus on dialogue and co-production. So there's also a little number there, which is 84.3%. So they did a survey and they asked people, do you think it's important or extremely important to provide an opportunity for people to discuss climate change? And 85% roughly said yes. So that there is, is a pretty good case to say why we need to have engagement. Because when it comes, again, there's a bit of a misconception about, well, that we don't need to engage people on this issue. We just need to make a policy decision and change it and fix the problem. But the, but the issue with that is that good policy needs to have support from people. And so we need to be able to engage people with this issue. And framing is a way that we can ensure that we're doing it in a meaningful way and in a productive way. 
and that we're not just going in loaded with our facts and loaded with what we think people should know, but instead we're going in with a better understanding and trying to engage with people on the same level. Just a couple of references from what I used, but um, I'm happy to send anything around to people if you're interested, but I, that's my 15 minutes. So thanks so much for listening. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I, uh, I, it was a challenge, I'm, I've no doubt, to fit that into 15 minutes and you did a marvellous job. Um, <laughs> Thanks. I, I've got a question or two I'd like to ask, but I imagine there might be a few around the table and I'll let others go first. Uh, do we have any questions out there? Put your hand up if, you, uh, if you'd like, or those on the phone, you just have to uh, unmute and, and start talking. None yet? Well, Mike, oh, no, Ian, okay, yeah, I'll unmute you there, Ian. Yeah, um, unmute. there you thank go. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I think Ian's still on mute. Mute and unmute, okay, well. There we go, okay. yep, you're yeah, good. Thank you very gotcha. much, very, very insightful, and uh, um, I, it, it's sort of where my head is at anyway, I'm just trying to think about how we transition as opposed to, uh, to kind of browbeat everybody into submission. Um, in that uh, last slide before that's currently still on the screen, um, why engage in, on climate change? One of the things that, um, yeah, the top scoring one is, the, is uh, that last or second last one, 86%. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what we're finding is part of that transition is basically getting awareness out of what climate change is about. I think for myself, as I started on the journey, um, I was aware, been aware for a long time about climate change, obviously, but, um, but what does it really mean? And um, so, um, so now we're talking about people. For me, I needed to understand more about the facts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is that, um, so and I'm seeing others agree with that. Is that just my personal preference that's coming through? and coming back to beliefs and values and things like that, or is that a, a general society type thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, and yes, it probably is the result of the fact that you're quite engaged with the issue. And so we do find that studies, like I mentioned before, that the breaking people up into different categories, along with that, not just with attitudes, but it goes also with people's willingness to want to learn more. And so, yeah, we do find that if you're more engaged with the issue, you're more likely to want to find more information and build a stronger case. But still underlying that is, are the values that you hold true. So you believe it to be, well, I'm not assuming for you, but you probably might believe it to be a really important issue, right? And so, and then you feel compelled to want to do something about it. And so that's where this whole argument about facts and values comes in, that it's not one against each other, but the values, is always, the values are always going to be there. But for some people, facts are going to be more resonant and for others, facts are not going to be as resonant. And so that's why it's really important to understand who we're talking to. So I would know that if I came to a, a group of such as yourself, you'd probably be very happy to, if I was a climate scientist, to listen to my facts. And that's totally fine. If you go to a more disengaged group, they may not be so receptive to those facts and it could be much easier to get them offside early on. Uh, yeah, can I speak? Yes, Rod. Yes. Oh, right. Uh, really good talk, Nick. I thought that's fantastic. I'm wondering uh, whether there's any research about framing to politicians. Hmm. You mean you mean like um, people talking to politicians? Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm asking. I know it's a bit of a a difficult one uh, without notice, but uh, I'm thinking of Citizens Climate Lobby as being a right. lobbying organisation and politicians being one of the main ones and maybe other members of the uh, with us today can say who other targets of uh, lobbying are, but i um, trying to think about how we make our conversations relevant or how we engage those people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't seen any, any research on that uh, myself. Doesn't That doesn't mean there isn't anything out there. But uh, I would say that, I mean, when it comes to, to this kind of engagement and communication, 
um, th there are ways to go about trying to understand what, what is more resonant for somebody. And we know that when we're trying to communicate, it is really important to, to understand values, to understand beliefs, because essentially if you, if you go into a conversation with somebody and you're, you're coming from a different standpoint, then you're getting this sort of cognitive dissonance straight away. And so I don't have an answer for you, but I could say that, that there are ways you could go about understanding that through a kind of engagement process and really understanding what matters to that person. Yeah, that was a bit of a, uh, a hard one without notice. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> An interesting one, though. Yeah, well, if you come up with something uh, later, maybe you can you can send it to us. Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, I'd look forward to that. It, uh, it would be good to know just how to get through the politicians. Katie. Hi, Nick. Thanks so much. That was really good. Um, I was wondering if there's been any, I mean, I sort of, I'm vaguely aware of this out there on the margins, but I'm wondering if you've seen any um, research within science comms on the kind of apocalyptic framing of climate change that you often see in like disaster movies or in casual discussion, um, mm. you know, the kind of millennial apocalypticism that you, you often see on Twitter. Has there been anything yeah. done on that that you're aware of? Yeah, it's a really good question. And yeah, I have seen some. Uh, it's not as prominent uh, as I probably would have thought. Uh, it did come up in this big sort of systematic map that we did to try and understand all this research. It was coming up, these apocalyptic frames. Something sort of related to that is the sort of crisis framing. So, you know, the climate crisis. And we hear this this sort of discourse coming out of groups like Extinction Rebellion, for example. Mm. And what fascinated me most about that was that I found a paper about framing this issue as a climate crisis back more than 10 years ago. So it's 11 mm. years ago now, which, which was strange to me because I, I thought that this was sort of a more recent phenomenon that people were talking about a climate crisis, but in research anyway, and in, and in conversations, it was mm. going on a lot, a long time ago. So I, I know that from reading that stuff, that there is a bit of, um, you know, caution as to whether we mm. frame climate change that way and, and frame it in terms of apocalypse, mainly because, um, we see these sort of um, events on a short scale, for example, like bushfires influenced by climate change. But there are obviously going to be periods where we're not having these natural disasters. We're not having these big problems that are making the issue very salient in people's minds. And so we run the risk of, of potentially um, drumming up a lot, of, a lot of noise about this and then people switching off and disengaging. And so mm -hmm. there's, a little bit, there's a little bit on it. And I would say that the, the opinions for, for that kind of framing are, are, are like also the other ones that are sort of mixed at the moment. So yeah. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. It was indeed. Um, so, um, Peter, do you have a question? Yes. Look, thanks a lot, um, Nick. I, I suppose a comment, first of all, um, some of this is familiar from um, uh, material that I've read, uh, by Rebecca Huntley and one of the points she made I think in the article is that the importance of being solutions focused um, and I just would be interested in any comments you have on that I, I can't remember all the details from what I read in her article but but she suggested that that was um, often a more valuable way of approaching climate issues rather than a, a disaster focused approach um, and I'll, I'll probably grossly simplifying her, her point but um, the other thing I, I wanted to say, though, is that obviously at the moment, um, any discussion of, of, of climate or almost any other issue is being completely um, submerged by um, coronavirus issues. Um, and that's understandable, um, but we are going to emerge from this at some stage. And, and I suppose I, I've been thinking, you know, what, what are the implications of, of the current corona crisis for climate change in, and climate change discussions in general? And one of the things I suppose has occurred to me that, that this whole um, pandemic issue has, has, I think, made us all much more aware of the, the fragility of our social and economic system and how much it depends on the natural environment. Uh, and, and can we use that to point out to people that similar sorts of slower disasters are coming uh, with climate change as well, unless we take action? And, and just what are, what are the lessons that we might be able to draw from from this pandemic that can we, we can apply to other things. So uh, any, any thoughts you have on those issues would be interested to hear. Yeah, thank you. So to your first point with solutions, um, I'd say yes, 
and sort of it goes in combination with what Katie was talking about with apocalypse framing because generally when it comes to climate communication usually you don't want to downplay the severity so you definitely want to tell people that it's a serious problem but usually you couple that with come some kind of efficacy message so that generally hits on a solution so saying what people can do and empower people mainly because it can be very easily easy to become paralyzed by seeing all of this and and i know some of you come along or engage with climate change institute events at anu uh and and they they're really great and sometimes they can just have such an overwhelming effect and so I would say, yes, yeah, solution framing is important, but obviously combining it with a message that emphasizes the seriousness of the problem is still also key. Again, balancing that out. Um, to your second point about like coronavirus, it's a great question. And I think, um, I think it's a great research topic as well. So there's also, there's also gonna be people asking the same questions about the bushfires. They're gonna say, okay, we've just had a huge unprecedented season of bushfires. Is that changing people's minds? There's a bit of anecdotal evidence to suggest no. Uh, and also there's a book by um, George Marshall, I think, uh, who one of the co-founders of Climate Outreach, this organization. He wrote a book about, um, essentially, it's, it's called um, Don't Bother Thinking About It or something like that. Uh, I, I, can, I can share it with you, like, with you if you like. But um, the point of that was that he found that through interviews with people in the United States after one of their natural disasters, um, he found that after that natural disaster, which was influenced by climate change, people became more complacent because they thought that it wasn't going to happen again. So mm. it didn't actually result in a lot of awareness raising. It actually resulted in the opposite effect. So really good questions. I'm sorry I don't have answers, but I have more, I have more questions in response to that because I think, it's a, I think it's a really fascinating thing to see how this plays out now and then what happens after. I think that's going to be a topic of research that we're going to start seeing some on soon. Okay, thanks. That's interesting. Good, good. Well, I, I've got uh, one last question that we better wrap up uh, and get on to our main meeting. Uh, it, you, you've uh, done really well. This is a wonderful topic, very important to us. The um, question I had was, <laughs> I noticed that health was something that obviously gets through to people who are uh, in the denying end of the spectrum. And... Uh, obviously, that's one we could uh, learn to concentrate on if we're trying to persuade those people. And I think politicians, to some extent, are amongst those. Uh, are there any other particular ones that you've noticed in your studies? Uh, you showed us the graphs. They only had uh, three different uh, frames that they spoke of. Are there other frames that uh, may, may be worth us considering? Yeah, so I think... At the moment, uh, something that came out of the, the, the research project that I've just been doing was some another frame that's becoming more um, um, worked on in terms of research is actually a subset of the morality frame and it's a religious framing. So there's a lot of work which has been done by climate outreach as well in engaging people um, in religious groups on this issue and using those kind of um, religious like store, sort of stewardship frames that really interested me because I think that's a really nice example of how some people might think that they're two very separate ways of thinking in science and religion. And there's been that ongoing battle. And so they might not see them as compatible, but framing is a potential way to bridge that. It's, it's, that's something that I'm noticing that is um, starting to get a bit more evidence. And those sorts of studies um, are being conducted in these engagement kind of focus group workshop settings. Uh, and I think that's where we can get a lot of value for how these frames operate in discourse. So I would say the, the morality framing, religious framing, public health, yeah, is, a, is one that's becoming a lot more salient. And, and I know that um, with, with our recent um, health crises and current health crises as well, um, I think that kind of framing is something that can be utilised. But then we also have to be thinking about at what point does that frame reach saturation? At what point does it not become effective anymore? And that's something we don't know a lot about. We, I can't give you any really good um, studies that have looked at that. So that's something, a future topic to try and understand at what point do these seemingly effective frames not have really much effect anymore? Like what's the life cycle, if you like, of a frame? So yeah, I would say morality, religious, public health, are the three of the really interesting ones at the moment. Great, great answer. Thank you very much, Nick.
And uh, yeah, really appreciate you joining us this morning and giving us that. If only we could show a little appreciation. This is the uh, the general way we do this when we're muted. It's uh, <laughs> if if it would be uh, yeah, uh, we really do appreciate you. Thank you very much.